Hello, it's Keith here and this is lesson 13 of the YQuest series and we're back on the Super Nintendo. Now we looked at the Super Nintendo before of course, but last time we were just using the tarmac for our graphics and that made for a rather unpleasant 8x8 eight eight sort of chunk movement of our characters where you can see everything's move, moving nice and smoothly now and that's because we're now using hardware sprites. So we've made some changes to the code and we're now using the sprites and that gives us a much nicer game. So today we're going to go through the code and we're going to discuss the changes that have had to be made to use hardware sprites on the Super Nintendo version. So this will be a nice introduction to sprites if you're not familiar with them. And as I say, just to generally discussing what changes were needed to this simple little game. Well, let's go over to our code and we'll have a look. Now, there's some common changes to the multi-platform part of the code that were made to support the sprites. Basically, not too much. Um, there was an unused byte of the object definitions that is now being used for the hardware sprite number. Basically, the game engine can either use the old time-up code or the new hardware sprite code for each object. If the hardware sprite number is 0 or 255, then it will use the old tile code. If it's 1 or above, then it will use the hardware sprites. So the reason I'm using 0 or 255 is because the bullet array resets to 255 and the other object resets to 0. So for simplicity, either of those is being considered as unused and the others are just being defined as a hardware sprite number. Now, of course, a hardware sprite can only have one position on the screen, so um, we are using different hardware sprites for every object on the screen. That works okay, because this game uses, I think it's 56 objects in total on screen maximum, and there's, uh, I think it's 64 hardware sprites on the Super Nintendo. There's certainly enough for all of our objects, so very simple here. So we're defining that sprite for being used by the hardware sprites. We then need to allocate a hardware sprite number to each of the objects. And we're doing that with this set hardware sprites function here. We just point the um, ZIX object to the first object that we want to change. And it will then allocate hardware sprite numbers to the successive objects until ZB reaches zero. So you'll see this used later on to allocate those hardware sprite numbers. Now, the other change to the code here is just here. This is the main object code that draws and moves objects around. It's been changed here and we're just checking to see if the hardware sprite number is 0 or 255. Well, actually greater than 128 to be precise. If it is, then we're using the old software sprite code. If it's not, it, then we are subtracting 1 because we're using um, hardware sprite 0 to probably something like 63. And um, we're using this hardware sprite code, which we'll see in just a moment. So that's the only changes to the multi-platform code. The rest is all exactly the same. Now, what about the platform-specific code? Well, we're defining the hardware sprite number just here. Actually, where is that? Let's see if we can find that. That's in the data desk, just a moment. Yeah, in the um, initialization for the object, player object, we're defining the hardware sprite number just there. And um, apart from that, we are then disabling the collision masks. We don't need them anymore because we've got nice smooth movement, so we can use nice precise collision detection. We are, however, having to define another buffer. If you remember, we couldn't change the tile map on the Super Nintendo outside of VBlank. We can't change the sprites either. So once again, we're creating a buffer for our sprites, um, hexadecimal 220 bytes uh, of data for our sprites. So that is the buffer. We're going to transfer it during our NMI interrupt, just like with the tile map. Now, that's what we're doing there. Now, next we need to define the data. Now, the 8x8 sprites are basically the same as the tile data. If we just go over here a second, we can see here. When we're defining 16x16 16 16 pixel sprites, the um, layout's a little bit weird. But for 8x8, we're actually using basically the same data as the tile, as the tile patterns. Now, the only slight difference is the um, order that we're using them, and I'll show you that in just a moment. But the data needs to actually be transferred to a different address. Now, we transferred our bitmap data to hexadecimal 1000. We're transferring our sprite data to hexadecimal 4000 here, and we're defining the address of that sprite data just here with this port setting here, 2101 defines the address. We're using memory address 4000 for our sprite data. Let's take a look at that sprite data right now. Now, basically, it's almost the same as our bitmap data. Now, we don't need the font this time, so you can see there's no font. But what we are doing is we're defining an empty sprite just here, a zero sprite for our blanking of objects there. So that's basically um, the sprite data we're defining here. Now, we do also need to use a different palette. The sprites use palettes 128 and onwards. Now, we defined our basic palette up here, and we were at that time using palette entry 0 and onwards. 
This time we're using entry 128 and onwards. We're using the same palette data though, and we're just transferring the data in the same way. Now, once we've done that, we're clearing the sprite buffer. As I say, this is just some regular memory that we're going to transfer during NMI. We just clearing using the CLDIR function, which is just going to set all of the bytes to zero. And then we're turning on the tile layer one here and also the sprite layer using port 212C. That will turn on the sprites. Now the rest of the work here is being done by the NMI interrupt handler, which is here. Now, basically, we've got almost the same code as we did for the tile map, just with some differences. Now, with regards to setting the sprite data, we use just a single port, 2104 here is our destination port that we need to use to write our sprite data. So whereas before we were writing to two consecutive ports, now we're writing to just a single port. So we need to write to memory address 4300, which defines how the DMA transfers data to ports. We're just writing to one single address this time. So we write a zero to that address, 4300. And then we write the port number. It's 2104 we want to write to. So we write 04 to 4301. We then specify the source address of the data we're transferring, which is defined by SNES sprite buffer. And that's a pointer that we've defined here. And we're just transferring that address here. Then we transfer the length 220 here, which is the all of the data for the sprites. And then we start the transfer just here. So basically, hopefully you can use this code as is to transfer your sprite buffer. Now, the location in RAM of the sprite buffer is defined just here. We're using a triple zero here. Now, let's just go over to our documentation here and we'll see the actual data we're having to define for each sprite. So here is a sort of template of the data which makes up the sprites. So each sprite has an X position, a Y position, and a tile number, and also a few extra here. And that's in the first pair of bytes and they're in consecutive memory addresses just here. Then there are a few extra bits that are in a separate sort of bank, if you will. And these are two bits per sprite. And so that would be sprite zero. That would be sprite one and onwards. And you can see it's the top bit of the X and also, um, the sprite size. Now the sprite size in our case is always going to be eight by eight pixels. So it's going to be pretty straightforward. But anyway, that's how we're doing things. Now, when it comes to actually defining the sprites, the first thing we're going to want to do is we're going to want to allocate a sprite number. And we're using that set hardware sprites function that we defined earlier. So what we're doing here is we're selecting a sprite number for the first sprite. We're selecting sprite hardware sprite number two here. And we're going to start defining the bullet array sprites and the count is just here and that's going to be eight. So we're setting the eight sprites there of the player bullets, setting the eight sprites here of the enemy bullets and the C is going to keep going up here. And then we set all of the objects in the object array because the Super Nintendo can handle enough sprites. It's actually 128, I think, so far more than we need for this example here. Okay, so that's how we're allocating the hardware sprite numbers. Now, during the clear screen routine, we need to clear that buffer to get all of the sprites off the screen, effectively setting all of the sprites to zero there. When it comes to drawing and clearing a hardware sprite, we've got the do get hardware sprite object function here. If we want to blank the sprite, basically if the hardware sprite is um, again between 1 and 128 here, then we are just setting the hardware sprite number to zero here and we're just clearing it in that way. When we want to draw a hardware sprite to the screen, we've now got this new do get h sprite object function here, which is a modified version of the old do get sprite object. Now, if you remember, this actually gets the settings from the object definitions, which is an eight byte definition, which is being pointed to by ZIX, the zero page entry here. And this will read in the sprite number, the X and Y position from that object here. And what we're doing here is we're just calculating the frame of the sprite that we want to show here. Now, the first sprite in the sprite definitions is blank. There are 16 sprites per frame. So we're calculating the frame number and calculating the pattern that we want to show for this hardware sprite. We're then calculating the X and Y position. Now, actually, this time, the X position is now too low resolution. The um, game logic works in two pixel horizontal chunks. Its, it's limit effectively is 128 um, units across and the screen is 256 across. The reason for that is it was designed to work up to 320 pixels wide in a single byte. So it was going from zero to 160. So um, now we're actually too low resolution. So we're just doubling up the X position there. But um, once we've done that, we then add 16 to the Y position because 0, 0, 0 is not a visible pixel on the screen. 
And then what we're doing here is we're using this set hardware sprite function, which will actually set the data within our buffer, the SNES sprite buffer, and this will set all of the bytes accordingly. So the first thing we're doing here is we are calculating the address within the buffer of the current hardware sprite. We're then transferring the X position, the Y position, the tile number, the additional attributes, things like the um, X flip, Y flip, the palette and things that we don't really use here. And then what we need to do is, if you remember, we need to set those additional two bits just here, which unfortunately are a bit of a pain. So what we're doing here is we are calculating the offset within that byte, depending on the bottom two bits of the hardware sprite number. And we're basically um, shifting the values we want to push in into the correct position, masking out, removing the old value for that position and putting in the new one and then storing it back into the buffer here. So that will handle the last two bits for us. But hopefully this function should be adequate for you to set all of the attributes of a hardware sprite within a buffer. So the idea is that maybe you can use this in your own code and basically I took this from my original platform specific example where I was just showing a simple sprite on the screen and I've modified it today to allow us to import the YQuest game with some nice hardware sprites and some proper movement. And you know, I know YQuest isn't anything ex amazing, obviously not, it's just a very simple game, but it is a playable game and um, it's a game you can download and you know, it can improve if you wish. Uh, it was really just a, a proof of concept, if you will, to um, show that we can get some hardware sprites and some tile movement working pretty effectively in a relatively simple game. So there we go. So that's all we're going to be covering today. Um, we've covered the NES before, if you're interested in that system. So please take a look at that episode if you want to see more Nintendo-based platforms. But um, if you've liked what you've seen today, you know, please like and subscribe because um, we'll be doing more Super Nintendo later on in the future. So um, if you've liked what you've seen, you know, please do that. If you like the videos, YouTube recommends them to other people as well. Basically, YouTube works based on how many people like videos to know how good they are and how much to recommend them. So that will really help out if you do like the videos. Whatever you do, though, I hope you have a lot of fun with the SNES. And please download my code if it's any use to you and do whatever you want with it. I really don't care. Anyway, I hope you have a lot of fun with your programming. Thanks for watching today and goodbye.